an apprehension to take it relative to neuropathy, so I want to get into that. But, you know, the, the basic uh, gist of P5P and where it's useful is in dopamine synthesis. <laughs> What's up, everybody? It's your boy Ryan, and this is the Thunder Channel on Nootropics, on TRT, on biohacking, and on male performance. Please subscribe to the channel because, hey, bro, I know you're going to love the content, so just hit the sub button now, bro. And I've got one of the most famous movie stars that just made a new movie on a series of movies that we all know and love, and he would really appreciate it, bro, if you would hit that like button. Who are we? We are Cortex Labs, and we make a couple high-level nootropic stacks, which you can get in the description of this video. I am an expert consultant and coach on nootropics, TRT, and a bunch of other things. And I've also created three powerful video courses on how to use nootropics to get good results, as well as nootropics guides that have a ton of free stacks in them. And all that stuff in the description of this video or at livecortex.com. So the full breakdown of P5P. Now, I recently did like, a, well, I did two posts. I did like a community post, a regular like text post here on YouTube, and then also a short on P5P. And they got a lot of attention, uh, particularly around people's kind of apprehension to take it relative to neuropathy. So I want to get into that. But, you know, the, the basic uh, gist of P5P and where it's useful is in dopamine synthesis. I mean, there's not many other powerful agents that allow you to synthesize usable dopamine than P5P, perhaps with the exception of things like 9-methyl-beta-carboline, obviously tyrosine, macunapurines, these things. But P5P is just involved in the process of dopamine synthesis in a very critical way that you kind of can't leave it out of the dopamine conversation. To prove this dopamine uh, synthesis notion, I want to take us to a paper called Safety and Efficacy of High-Dose Vitamin B6 as an Adjunctive Treatment for Antipsychotic-Induced Hyperprolactinemia in Male pa uh, Patients with Treatment-Resistant Schizophrenia. So this is a case where, just to explain the kind of context, where an antipsychotic, which is effectively dopamine receptor blockade, induced hyperprolactinemia. That is a state of elevated prolactin. That's a hormone you don't want in excess quantities. Now, the reason that that would happen is because the dopamine D2 receptors that are in the pituitary act as control over prolactin release. So when the when dopamine itself is not agonizing those receptors, then prolactin can basically secrete sort of uncontrolled. That's why when people take kratom, they get high levels of prolactin, a shutdown of their gonadotropins, and thus lower testosterone and sexual side effects. This is why people take like opioid receptor agonists. Kratom is an opiate receptor agonist, but there are plenty of others that do that too, and then end up with sexual problems because of the elevated prolactin, the inhibition of the gonadotropins, and then the lack of testosterone production. But at the same time, hyperprolactinemia can be induced by antipsychotics as their main mechanism is blockade of the dopamine receptors. Now, in this particular paper, basically what they did is high dose B6, and that acted similar to just giving someone a D2 agonist. What it probably ended up doing is synthesizing more dopamine, that dopamine through the hypothalamus bound to the pituitary D2 receptors and that stopped the prolactin secretion, right? Or inhibited it at some large capacity. This is why people talk about P5P or even vitamin B6 as an anti-prolactin agent. It's per because of dopamine. So in this particular case, just to talk about doses, they were giving uh, vitamin B6 300 milligrams every 12 hours for 16 weeks. Now that is certainly high. We're going to talk about the neuropathy and potential, potential problems that could come about. But look, I mean, the vitamin B6 group showed a 68.1% reduction in serum prolactin levels. Okay. When you're looking at a number that's that significant, I mean, this is huge. This is indicating high level dopamine synthesis and therefore dopamine binding right on the pituitary, inhibiting that prolactin secretion. So major takeaway, if you've got high levels of prolactin and you're not controlling it otherwise, and you know, it's not like a pituitary adenoma that secretes prolactin, take P5P or B6. You're probably better off taking P5P and you will more than likely get a reduction in prolactin. But anyway, I just want to show you that paper because that, that proves the, the dopamine synthesis theory that B6 is helping you do that. Now, all P5P is relative to vitamin B6 is the active forms. So like B6 itself, when you're taking B6 in a supplement, that, that's not, it's an inactive form of vitamin B6. That's what B6 is, inactive. Like B6 has to go through a conversion process to essentially become pyridoxal phosphate or P5P. Now I'm going to break down what P5P does to me, what the dose range is, like a safe dose range to kind of keep it in, and what you can expect 
when taking it. So number one, my dose range is usually 100 to 200 milligrams, but the general dose range is 50 to 200 milligrams. You know, look, a lot of people are going to get away with, especially those worried about neuropathy and side effects from high doses of it, taking a mere 50 milligrams of P5P and getting a good result. What it usually feels like literally for me is about an hour and some change later, I have increased motivation, increased energy, and like a zest for life. A, a case in point or a good example of this is just the other day, the last time that I took P5P, I'm looking at my yard, my backyard. Yard and I'm looking at the front yard where there's like the small patch of grass and it's like overgrown and I haven't mowed it in a while and I just didn't feel like doing it. And then when the P5P kicked in, I was like, why the hell am I not doing it? Like, I would love to do this. Th this is great. I would love to look at it when it's done, indicating that the reward response, which is heavily reliant upon dopaminergic signaling, was better. And at the same time, it kind of just gives me generally better energy. Better sex drive, yeah, more dopamine is going to equal better libido, assuming that testosterone and estradiol are in the right place for you, and that prolactin isn't elevated. And if prolactin is elevated, taking P5P is almost guaranteed to lower it, which is going to lead to better sex drive. And number four, better erections, and that's probably via, well, it's obviously via the dopamine, but it may be due to lowering prolactin. I mean, with P5P, you could probably lower your refractory period, which is the period after orgasm where you're kind of not interested in sex. You could lower over that period to then be able to go for round two a lot sooner. And that's just because prolactin itself is really the driver of sexual satiety. And so that it, it, it does rise post orgasm. I'd say 10 to 15 nanograms per milliliter is what the literature says. It doesn't stay elevated very long, but it may stay elevated for a day or two or more, depending on your situation. But, you know, lowering prolactin and enhancing dopamine via P5P is going to lead to better erections. So that's the general dose range. Okay, guys, 50 to 200 milligrams. Again, if, if you take any more than that, you run the risk of overstimulation, right? Potential spillover to neuroadrenaline, adrenaline, and that doesn't feel good. I don't know if you know, you felt that before when you're making too much of the other catecholamines, you basically feel like shit. You're wound up, you're agitated, you're anxious. It doesn't feel good. To get the right targeted, you know, dopamine synthesis for you, you ought to start at 50 milligrams and then work your way up to 200 milligrams if you absolutely need to. I wouldn't take this stuff every day. We're going to talk about some of the downsides or the cons of P5P, but it would be useful to use for those of you that think you have dopaminergic issues and then taking P5P in these do in this dose range and then seeing if, if those issues alleviate. Then you can pinpoint, okay, dopamine is the issue, and maybe you can work on it via 9-MEBC. That's like a real kind of dopamine systems regeneration chemical, you know, and, and possibly approach it a different way or just continue taking P5P at safe doses where you're not going to get side effects. All right, so the elephant in the room, guys, cons of P5P. Now that we've broken down the dopaminergic mechanisms and how it could be useful, let's talk about the neuropathy. All right, now I want to make a distinction here, and this is very important, that there are no scientific papers on P5P itself, which is the active form of B6 for neuropathy. There are papers on regular B6 in high doses inducing neuropathy. And what it looks like is happening is, number one, it's inhibiting GABAergic function, okay? So, you know, if you want to get around that, if you're taking just B6 and not P5P, but potentially P5P, just take a GABA precursor, like take a GABA supplement or take maybe some picamillin or, or figure out a way through theanine or other GABA modulatory chemicals to make sure you have enough GABA so that this doesn't happen. Now, just so you understand, you know, it's not P5P that in the literature says that it can induce neuropathy at high doses. It's actually just B6, which is pyridoxine, which is the inactive form of vitamin B6, right? Again, the active form is really P5P. And you would think, okay, well, that doesn't matter. The B6 here is just going to turn into P5P, but actually that's not true. And this is part of why people get side effects from it. So here's the deal on neuropathy. Excessive PN, which is pyridoxine, that's the inactive form of vitamin B6. It's what you may find in some supplements. Now, a lot of that should convert to actual P5P and usable dopamine, therefore, but some of it may actually be inhibited. What they say here is excessive PN intake, so excessive B6 intake, induces neuropathy through preferential injury of sensory neurons. Recent reports on hereditary neuropathy due to uh, pyridoxal kinase mutations may provide some insight into the mechanism as genetic deficiencies in pyridoxal kinase lead to the development of axonal sensory neuropathy. High circulating concentrations of PN, or again, the inactive form of B6, which is pyridoxine, may lead to a similar condition via the inhibition of PDXK, which again is pyridoxal kinase. I'm going to get to what that is in just a second. The mechanism behind pyridoxal kinase-induced neuropathy is unknown. However,
However, there is reason to believe that it may be related to the neurotransmitter GABA. And ultimately, if you dig deeper in literature, it ends up being the inhibition of GABA. Okay. So if you're worried about P5P or B6 induced neuropathy, make sure that you don't have a GABAergic problem and make sure that, you know, if you run into those issues, you can either dial the dose back, stop taking it completely or play around with bringing in a GABAergic, something that will make you make more GABA like picamillin or like a regular GABA supplement. And that will more than likely, you know, resolve the issue if you're running into those problems. Again, they go compounds that inhibit uh, PDXK, which again is pyridoxal kinase lead to convulsions and reductions in GABA biosynthesis. If you look in all the literature around B6, you know, this whole neuropathy thing is basically an inhibition of GABA. And this happens at very high doses and there is no literature on P5P doing this. Here's what's interesting. If you, you know, go research what pyridoxal kinase is, pyridoxal kinase is a B6 salvage enzyme involved in the primary inactive vitamin B6 into the active form, which is P5P. Okay, so, you know, in other words, high doses of B6 are actually inhibiting this here, okay? They're inhibiting pyridoxal kinase. So, therefore, that would mean you're not, you're not really synthesizing that B6 into active P5P, which is the active form of, B, of uh, B6. But instead, what it ends up doing is, again, looking at the literature, it ends up going and inhibiting GABA biosynthesis, right? So, uh, what I think is happening in this neuropathy thing is that, you know, if people are just taking not P5P, but B6 in high concentrations and eventually instead of converting to active p5p it is just inhibiting gaba biosynthesis and thus you have these problems because if you're if you're inhibiting this which is the mechanism of you know b6 induced neuropathy if you're inhibiting pyridoxal kinase well that means you're not turning that pyridoxal kinase into p5p so it actually is the case that p5p itself is not you know neuropathy inducing it's b6 that isn't actually converting to P5P and is inhibiting GABAergic neurotransmission, okay? So I just wanted to clear that up for folks. I'm not saying it doesn't happen because there are plenty of like, uh, even with P5P, there are Reddit anecdotals of people saying that they had neuropathy-like symptoms when they're taking P5P. And the only mechanism that I can think is happening here would be the inhibition of GABA, although it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me that, you know, post the conversion of the, you know, regular pyridoxine into P5P that that would happen. Because again, that's not the mechanism for B6-induced neuropathy. But I mean, the, the only mechanism that, you know, is somewhat clear in the literature is the inhibition of GABA. So by some other mechanism, P5P at high concentrations may inhibit GABA biosynthesis, which could lead to neuropathy-like, uh, you know, effects. However, again, you know, kind of back to this whole dose range thing. And again, I think, you know, I don't want to be flippant in any of this or gaslight people that this isn't happening. I want to be absolutely clear that you should be safe when, when taking this and experiment for yourself and see if you get side effects versus not. Weigh out, you know, how much dopamine you actually think you need versus, you know, the probability of side effects. If you stay in the 50 to 200 milligram range and don't dose the stuff every day, like I maybe dose people P5P two times, three times a week, and it's usually 200 milligrams. I'll either take four capsules at a time, four 50 milligram capsules, or I'll split it up in two and two. So I'm getting 100 milligrams earlier in the day, and then 100 milligrams later in the day. I've never had any side effects from it so far, other than if I go, if I take it too consistently, I only take it a couple times a week. If I take it four or five times a week, I start to get disruptions in sleep. I start to feel a little on edge, a little agitated, and that may be too much dopamine, or it also may be extra synthesis of the other catecholamines, like neuroadrenaline and adrenaline. You don't want that. All right, so if you stay in this range here, you are unlikely to run into side effects. Now, if you're somebody that's prone to neurological issues, right? You have Lyme disease. That's like somebody commented that they have Lyme and that P5P sort of gave them neuropathy-like symptoms that they were already prone to it having had Lyme. If you have another condition in which you're prone to neuropathy, then maybe P5P isn't, you know, isn't for you. And if you need dopamine synthesis, you probably ought to target it in some other way. There's many ways to skin the cat on dopamine. Believe me, my friends. All right, but for everybody else, you're looking at increased motivation, energy, zest for life, better sex drive, better erections, better gym energy, like dopamine, okay? When you fire dopamine at adequate quantities, it's sort of a life-changing thing if you're not used to firing dopamine at adequate quantities. Like it makes you motivated. It turns on the reward system. It gets you interested and stuff that you should be interested in that you're not interested in in your, you know, hypothetically like suboptimal state otherwise. All right, so P5P, pretty epic for giving you dopamine so long as you're dosing it correctly and safely. Cons, B6 itself, but not P5P 
inhibits salvage enzymes that convert inactive B6 into P5P, which leads to the lack of synthesis or inhibition of GABA, and that leads to neuropathy-like symptoms. That is the proposed mechanism here. Now, P5P itself may be able to do this too, although there's no piece of literature that suggests that, and I don't really know the mechanism. Again, because what's happening on the other side is regular B6 is inhibiting pyridoxal kinase, again, that salvage enzyme involved in the metabolism of primary B6 into P5P. And again, you know, that is making this uh, inhibition on GABA synthesis and causing the neuropathy. So I'm not sure the mechanism for how P5P could do that. However, just to be on the safe side, you want to be mindful of it because there are reports of P5P inducing this in people as well. And those are largely Reddit anecdotals, but no published papers. All right, as I said in the beginning, yeah, we are a high-level performance company, primarily for males. Uh, we make a couple really epic products that are shipped globally. Number one, the Torque Nootropic Stack. I mean, hey, look, if you want clean stimulant energy that is both dopaminergic, cholinergic, and energy-inducing via the adenosine receptor antagonism, go get the Torque Nootropic Stack. I know that sounds all sciencey, but what that ends up meaning is better brain performance for you. Noticeable motivation, elevated mood, and good energy down in the description of this video. If you need to hire me for any one of my specialties, but you can check out on the consultations tab at livecortex.com. I'm a high level coach on all things relative to nootropics, testosterone replacement therapy, especially dialing in protocols. I'm getting a lot of emails about this and a lot of calls. These guys are just kind of, you know, lost on how to get their protocols dialed in where they get all the benefits and no side effects from TRT, energy optimization, host of other things. You can check out all my specialties at livecortex.com and you can book an email consult with me, a call consult with me. I've got larger packages for serious business people. You can do all that stuff in under a minute at livecortex.com. Go check out our guides. They have nootropic stacks in them that are tested with clients and that are highly effective. We also have three nootropics courses that teach you from the ground up how to use nootropics like a pro. Also want to say, hey, follow me on Instagram. I just started posting again on Instagram and I'm not posting like nootropics and TRT related stuff. I'm just like posting kind of like motivation stuff for guys. That's like really what I'm into these days, like motivating men to be better. So check me out, Ryan Michael Ballow on Instagram. All right, everybody. Later.